What's up, everybody? Welcome to a, another town hall. This is our April Redwood Town Hall. We try to do this every single month and just share a lot of the things that we've been working on. We're also trying to highlight somebody within the community and answer any questions that you may have. So we are streaming to YouTube and Twitter and would love to hear from you. If you're in the comments, let us know where you're at. Um, I see Keith and Raj, Ryan, awesome. So always good to see you guys even in the chat. So feel free to stick a question there if you have one and I'll try and be watching the feed. The first thing that I did want to highlight, just a few housekeeping things that if you've been following along, um, we are doing React server components. We are all in and our next epoch of development we're calling Bighorn. So we would love as much feedback as possible from the community as you're looking at things. And so if you're interested in having more of an insider view, I'd encourage you to check out the React Server Components Working Group. And you can use that QR code. What that will do is it'll take you to a Google form for you to fill out. It does ask for your email address, but that's so that we can invite you to our Slack. So make sure that you use the email address that you want to use within Slack. And we'll get you plugged in and would love to give you kind of the inside scoop on the things that we're working with. Awesome. So uh, the first thing that I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about um, the blog. So if you have gone to uh, the Redwood JS website, you'll notice that things look a little bit different right now. And we have a dedicated blog. And I released a post on March 27th talking about how each of these major frameworks are setting up routers. Um, I also have one coming out talking about data fetching. So we're going to talk a little bit about all the different options that you are available right now. So it's going to be a little strange being in a Redwood Town Hall talking about Next and Remix. But for me, it was really eye opening just to understand what are the opinions and the decisions that are being made and what really makes Redwood Redwood. So the first thing that I wanted to do is I have a repo. So you can, if you go to this blog post, you can actually see this link for this repo. Um, awesome. The readme is fantastic. But what this does is I have each of the frameworks within this repo and you can look at the example code that is used within that blog post. So if we look at Next, so if you're familiar with Next, they have really two different options. They have a pages API and an app API. And this particular project is using the pages API. And the way that their router works is that it is a file based routing system. So if I go into slash about, you'll, you can see that you would just have a regular about page. That's with that index.js. If you look at that, it's just rendering out about text on the page. But if you go into the team page, you can see there's the, just some team text. But the fact that I have a file named team.js or just index.js is what determines what pages are getting delivered to the end user. If you want to do any layouts or things like that, all of that gets um, handled through components, as you might expect kind of in the traditional sense. And the reason that I highlight that is because if you look at how Next.js works with the app API, and I'll pull this up, works a little bit different. So instead of a pages directory, I now have an app folder and it's doing something similar. But now if you come inside here, you'll see that it's a folder based routing system. So now instead of having team.js, I have to have a folder called team. And instead of index.js or TSX, it has this page.tsx. And what's interesting about this particular setup is you can have a layout that then gets passed down to each of the child components or the child routes. So in this case, this layout is going to affect both the about page and our team page as well. One of the things that I found with both of these structures is that if you want to move files and folders around, you really have to be intentional about how you name things to make sure that you get the routes that you want. The other thing with the app API is that you can co-locate your components 
directly with the pages that are affecting those things. So for example, in this team folder, there's a headshot.tsx. That doesn't mean there's a route headshot. What that means that the, is that there's a component that is getting used within that page file. So if I were to move this team folder, say put it in another subdirectory, uh, maybe make it about slash company slash team, then, <laughs> excuse me, any files that I'm referencing in this page might change because of the imports and things like that. And so that's something to take into consideration. VS Code generally does a good job of handling those imports with those relative file paths, but I have run into situations where that does create problems when you start moving files and folders around. Uh, let's take a look at Remix. So I'm gonna pull this up. So this is still within the same repo, just looking at a different folder. And they're using a routes directory here. And they do something similar to Next in the sense that there are folders, but what's different is that it is a flat folder structure. So even though I have about slash team, this folder is still located in the same folder as just say slash about or even the home page. So if I pull this up, you pull up the about team. You can see I can also have the component that is being used specifically on that page. But the other thing that's interesting is that within this about folder here, this is not the about page. This is just the layout. The fact that this has dot underscore index means that this is the home page. So this is pretty easy to parse and to grok if it's a small project like this one, but I've also run into situations where if you have tons of pages and tons of routes as your application grows and scales, sometimes this can be hard to manage and to try and figure out where the layouts are affecting which pages, especially if you have, say, layouts that that URL is not included in the URL. I go into a little bit more detail within that blog post if you want to check it out. Let's take a look at Redwood and if you are familiar with Redwood, then this might look familiar. You might feel a little bit like home. <laughs> so um, the structure for this particular setup is heavily inspired by Rails. So if you have experience with other frameworks like Rails, this should look really familiar. So instead of using files and folders, there is a single file within the web source directory called routes. And here I'm listing out a router component. I have a set that wraps my about page and my team page. And this set has a layout. Um, here's the team page. So you can see that it's referencing the team component. And then I also have my about page component. Um, so this makes it really easy to tell at a glance what routes and files and folders you, uh, what, how your project is structured. So if I were to say, oh, where's my contact page? Instead of having to dig through the directory, I can just come to my routes page and search for team and say, oh, here's the team page. I know exactly where it lives. So I've come to really appreciate this. It also makes it easy to move things around if you wanna change the structure. And you can also have say like a cat page component and the route is called slash dog. Uh, obviously that'd be confusing. It's not recommended, but it does give you a lot more flexibility in how you name things and whether the internal way that you refer to something is different than the external thing. Uh, a prime example of this might be if you have, say, a login page, and maybe you want to change that from login to sign in. And so that becomes very easy because you can just change the path name. And with Redwood, because you reference routes based on that name attribute, none of your links break, which is another awesome thing that Redwood has built in in terms of developer experience. Now, um, another thing that makes a framework a framework, a, a lot of it is using the router. So all of these frameworks are using React. And so the components themselves will look the same, but how they get implemented and delivered to the end user might be slightly different. So let's look at data fetching, because that's another huge thing, right? 90%, probably even higher, of your web applications, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create, read, update, and delete data. So let's look at how data handling works. I'm gonna start back with Next, and we'll kind of work our way back through the frameworks again. Um, we'll look at a different example here. 
but in this particular project, this is for uh, Compressed FM. So I co-host a podcast called Compressed FM. This code is live-ish. And the reason I say ish is because we've rebuilt it on top of Remix. So if you look at it right now, you'll notice that this does have a next folder inside. This is actually an older piece of code. So you have to go back to the commit history, but you'll see that there is a next folder. Um, and I'm going to pull up uh, the episode page specifically. So here, this is a page where we list out all of the episodes on a single page. And we know exactly what that route is. That route is going to be slash episodes. And actually, you can go to compress.fm slash episodes and you can see that. Granted, it's being handled in Remix, but the code is basically the same. So here, we're using a uh, function called get static props. And what that does is it will grab all of the content. We're using Sanity on the back end. So it's grabbing all of the episodes that we have from Sanity. And then it returns it within a props object. And that gets picked up here within our page component. So all of this lives within a single file. You can see here that I have a episode page component and I'm just prop drilling. I'm passing all of that content into that particular component. So this gets pulled at runtime, uh, or excuse me, at build time. So as soon as I deploy my project on the server, it's gonna build out the site. It's gonna grab all that information from Sanity, almost hard code that in and pass as much HTML and CSS to the browser as possible. So the benefit there is you obviously get SEO benefits, you get performance benefits, um, but the problem is anytime that we release a new episode, which is once or twice a week, then we've got to rebuild the site. So that is just a click of a button, but depending on how large or how data intensive your website is, that could take as much as 10, 15, 30 minutes in order for it to build. So just something to keep in mind. Now this works great if it's on a given URL. So we know that it's going to be slash episodes. What happens if we don't know exactly what that URL is at build time? Um, we have to figure that out. So for example, the individual episode page, let me pull up another example. So this is still next. This is still using the pages API. It looks like I lost my camera. Actually go full screen. There we go. Whoops, wrong one. Perfect. Okay. So here what's happening is we are, this is the grok. This is the language that sanity uses. And I still have my get static props that you saw before, but I also have a thing here called get static paths. And so a lot of times you'll see get static paths and get static props used together in conjunction. So what's happening is that get static props is calling sanity and it's saying, Hey, grab all of the episodes that you have. And then I'm mapping over it. So I'm trying to prep it in a way that next can use it. And I'm creating an array of all of the paths that I have. So you can see there's a params object here where I am passing it the slug for each individual episode. Then this gets passed into uh, get static props. It actually uses it because you can see there it's referencing the params. Let me make this code a little bit bigger. And then what's happening is it's going, it's taking that param and it's making us another call to sanity. And it's saying, hey, use that slug that I just passed in and grab all of the information for each individual episode and then return that with props. So then this piece happens similar to that episodes part that we just looked at. So it's passing the episode information into my episode component and then handing that off to another component. So there's a little bit of data passing around and then there's some prop drilling because I'm having to hand it from one component to the next. The Again, the benefit of this is this all happens at build time. So it's able to determine what URLs it needs to grab, and then it will build all that information. But as we talked about before, when we were looking at just get static props, this does create problems when you need to rebuild the site. So I've worked on a few client projects where it's like, oh, okay, you want your stuff to be snappy. You don't update it a lot. Awesome. We'll just reach for get static paths and get static props. 
but then they have an administrative assistant come in and they start trying to add content to sanity. And they're like, why is this not displaying on the site? What's happening? The site's broken. And then I have to explain, no, you've got to build the site every time you want to see that update. So that's a little bit of confusion there. There's some, a learning curve and that can create a piece of friction there, especially if you need to make a change quickly. Um, that page might not change often, but if you need the information to be displayed on the site quickly, it can create a problem. So Next does provide another option when it comes to data handling. This is Git server side props. So this is the same project also on compressed FM, but the difference is this is the home page. So on the home page, instead of using Git uh, static paths and Git static props, I'm using a function called Git server side props. And the difference here is this code actually runs on the server. It doesn't have to be built ahead of time. So anytime somebody pings the home page, it's going to make this request on the server. So the benefit is on the client, it's not having to handle all of that information, but it is going to, you're going to see a small hit with performance because it's having to make that query every single time that the home page gets hit. Let's look at another option that Next has. So this is a completely different project. I'm going to pull this up. Um, this project is called Made with Zeta, and it was a gallery project where I'm showcasing projects that are made with Zeta. So Zeta is a backend as a service. Uh, they have a database feature that you can store data in. And if you look at how this operates, so this is using the app API. This is using React server components. What's interesting about this particular setup is that it is fetching the data directly within that homepage component. Remember before there were several components outside of our homepage that then we were having to pass that data around. So in this case, it's making a call on Zeta. So it's using Zeta kind of similar to the Sanity API. It's grabbing all of the projects that are listed as approved. And then I'm filtering them to find the ones that are in the carousel. So this is all getting saved within a projects variable and a featured projects variable. And then that gets displayed or passed in as a prop to the component that needs it. Actually, if you come down here, you can see I'm mapping over all of those projects and displaying them individually. So the advantage here is that it's not having to be built ahead of time. It can do it as the user requests that information. It moves a little bit faster because it does happen on the server and the data is tied tighter or closer to the component that's actually using it. So let's take another look at different implementation. So this is Remix. And it is worth noting that Remix is working on a React Server Components or RSC implementation. So here, this is, um, we're back on the compressed site. And this is the current iteration of the site. So you'll see that there's just this Remix folder. And inside of their app, routes directory. Here's all the routes that are running on the site. I'm going to come down to the home page again. So this is underscore index. You can see I have several components that are inside that folder that are using it. And what's interesting about Remix is they use what's called a data loader pattern. So here I have a function called loader, and that's loading all of the content. This runs on the server. So there's a very clear delineation of what happens on the server and what happens on the client. So it's grabbing all of my episodes from Sanity, and then it's returning that via this object and any of the other data that I want to grab out of Sanity. Then within the component, I have to use this use loader data hook in order to grab all of that information. And then this can be used within the components below and displayed to the site. So this is kind of an interesting setup. There is a lot of prop drilling. And one of the downsides that I've found to this is sometimes my files start to feel really fat. I'll have a very large loader function at the top that loads that data, processes it and handles it. The nice thing is it happens all on the server, but then I've got to deliver that to the appropriate component and drill that down. So that's one thing that I do like about Redwood and how we've handled things. So I'm going to pull up um, the new way. So the old, uh, let me pull this up here. 
So the new way with React Server Components, because that's what we're really interested in, right? So if you're familiar with Redwood, we have a concept called cell. And the cool thing about a cell is that you know whenever you're dealing with data, there's four different states that you have to take into consideration. You have a loading state, you have an empty state, you have a failure state, and you have a success state. And the cool thing about Redwood is it's smart enough to figure out, are you still loading that data? Let me show you a loading component. Is the data set empty? Let me show you that particular component. Or did it fail? Let me give you an error. Or was it successful? Let me show you the success of that particular component. So it handles that for you. You don't have to have a bunch of conditionals within your component. So historically, we've been tightly coupled to GraphQL. And we will always continue to support GraphQL as a first class citizen, but we are providing additional options. So in this particular case, this is a React server component. I'm sure Rob's going to walk through this a little bit more in this particular project that he worked on. But you'll notice here at the top, I have a data function that is grabbing all of this information. This is a server side component that is then passing that information down. So the beautiful part about this particular setup is I can drop this photo cell anywhere on my site and it has everything that it needs in order to load the data and then display it. So personally, I found this whole exercise of like, okay, how does everybody do this? What are the things that we have opinions about? And then trying to distill that and break it down to see what makes a framework really a framework and the opinions that we've chosen. So I'm gonna hand the baton, so to speak, over to Rob and let him walk through this particular project and just React Server Components in general. Hello, am I here? All right, let me present just a second here. Hi, everybody. Okay, so if you go to the blog, uh, we wrote a big blog post here. You can click on this big green button or you can get to it through the menu there. And it's called React Server Components, now in Redwood JS. And this is just a big breakdown of everything that we've been working on and what state it's currently in. And I'm going to walk you through quickly in this discussion how to, you would convert a GraphQL app, what I'm calling a classic Redwood app, into the RSC version as it, as it currently stands, our current implementation of RSC. And I got a couple of graphs here. So before I show this graph, let's look at the code, right? This is kind of the classic. This assumes you're somewhat familiar with Redwood already. Um, this is a cell, right? We have the query, and you'll see a GraphQL query in there to get a list of products in this case. And there's a loading state, failure state, empty state, and then success, right? The products that were returned from this query are sent into success here, and then you do whatever you need to do with them. So what does that conceptually look like in this uh, execution diagram here? So we got the browser, and let's say the browser is going to go to uh, the photo. I want to edit this photo, photos123 slash edit. So it goes up to the web server. Remember, we have the web and the API side, two separate servers. So it's going to go up, and the web server is going to respond, OK, here's index.js, which is all the React that's needed to start the app running in the client. So React's going to render, and then it sees, oh, here's a cell. So I'm going to show the loading state of that cell. So loading is going to continue on through these steps. And then it's going to make the GraphQL call back to the API server now, saying photo for photo123, I need the ID and name. So the GraphQL is going to go, it's going to get the photo resolver, which in Redwood's case, we've packaged those all in services, right? And now here's an actual database call, DB photo find unique by the ID. And then that goes back to the database, returns the data, that gets transformed, Prisma transforms that to JS. JS gets transformed into GraphQL, and that comes all the way back up to the browser. And now here's the actual, this, this should say photo, this is products. Here's the photo you were looking for. And now uh, React in the client says, okay, loading is now done. Now I'm going to render success with this data. And that's how a cell is built in the browser. So what does it look like in the RSC world? Let's go down here. Let's skip the graph here quickly and we'll look at the code. So it's almost the same, except instead of this all caps query export, now there's a data and it's a function. And now in here, you can do things that you would just do normally, you would do on the server, but you can do it directly in the cell now. So now I'm saying, hey, I want to find many products right here in the actual cell component, which is crazy, right? Loading, failures, empty. And then again, here's success. And success actually looks identical, right? Products come in, you loop over them, do, do whatever you need to do. So if we go back up to the graph, now there's only one server. Notice there's no more web and API, it's just the server. So the browser goes up and says, hey, I want to edit photo one, two, three. Service is OK. Here's the index.js, which is all the, re all the React code that's needed. 
React does its thing. And now what it does is it renders up to a layout and says, oh, wait, there's a page. I need, I need the code for this page. I'm going to go RSC style. I'm going to get this from the server. So there's a special URL, this rw-rsc. You'll see this request squad if you look at the network. And it's going to go whatever page was requested. In this case, it was the edit photo page. Remember, we were editing a photo here. And the server says, oh, I know, I know what I need to do with that. So I'm going to start rendering the page here. And as it's running the page, it's like, oh, wait, there's a cell in here. Now it's a server cell. So I need to render this cell. I need to get this data. So it's going to call that data function. It's going to see that database call. Now it's going to go right to the database, come back. Again, results get turned into JS. But now that's, that's it, right? There's no more GraphQL involved in there. So that step is done. And as it's rendering this, it renders out to the page and boop. And now it returns something called flight. We'll look at that later. That's new in React server components. And the flight gets returned to the browser. It's this weird syntax like this. And now React on the client has all it needs to do to finally re render the page in the browser itself. And that's it. So let's look at the app where I'm doing this. So what I did is I created two apps. Um, I'm calling them Cambium. This is the layer of a tree right under the bark. This is where like all the growth happens in a tree. We like our tree puns at Redwood. And I first created this app in GraphQL, and then I converted it from GraphQL to RSC. So we'll see that this, these two tabs here, we'll look at the code. But all that this app does is you get this little photo table of all a bunch of photos. And you can click on one, and you get some simple adjustments. And this just all happens with CSS. CSS actually has some neat filtering capabilities. So you can kind of play with your photo here. And you can saturate it. That looks a little crazy. Let's do something like that. And you can add some film ring. And then if you want, you can look at the metadata. And this is being pulled out of the file directly. This isn't stored in database somewhere. This is on the server. It's opening the file, looking at the metadata, reading it, and returning it here. So this is where all the stats of this photo when I took it. And then the idea is you can share your photo. You copy this URL. You could potentially send this to somebody. And they would see the photo with your edits. And then you get the little metadata data down here. And if they wanted to, then they could remix your photo. I maybe should have picked a better name for that since it's another framework. They can remix your photo. They start with your adjustments, and they can make their own adjustments, right? And then they can share it. So that's the Cambium app. So let's see, what does that look like in the actual code? So this is the classic version. I call this Cambium Classic. And in this blog post, if you go down, I'll have links to both these repos. So you can see the before and after. Uh, so let's look at this home page, right? So this page here, how is this page being built? So this is just the home page, and all it does is render a cell. And in the cell here is our classic GraphQL cell. So we've got our query to get the photos, loading empty failure, and success. We get the photos, loop over them, done. And each photo shows a slide. And if you're, if you're really young, you may not know what slides are, but you can ask your parents what these little white squares are here. This is how they used to look at photos in the olden days. <laughs> um, and then uh, if we look up here, right, it's a classic GraphQL app. So we have an API side with services, and I have the photos service. And all this does is go through a directory. Again, I, I didn't use a database just to keep things as simple as possible. So what this does is it literally goes through this web public photos directory. Here's all the photos. So it actually just reads these photos in. And that's how it gets like the metadata and such. So I think this photo here, this is that photo we were looking at. All right, it's right there in the code. And so the service just has two endpoints. It has give me all the photos and then give me the detail for a single photo. And that's how you can edit the photo. And this is the one that gets the metadata. So you can see all the, the stats of when the photo was taken, all that stuff. OK, so that's the classic GraphQL version. What does this look like when we transfer it to React Server Components? So now this is the Cambium RSC project. And you'll see the home page is the same, photo cell. If we go to photo cell, now all uppercase query export right is now the data export instead function. Photos are photos, and that's it. Now, how does this work? Because there's no API side now, right? There's literally no API directory. Where is this service coming from? Well, now this is running on the server. This can live wherever you want it to live. So in this case, I just put it in web source services. It's the same service, same code, right? Gets the photos, gets the metadata. But now it actually lives in the quote unquote web side. We'll have to come up with new nomenclature for this because there's no really distinction between web and API. Now it's just the server. So this might end up changing. So now the service lives right next to the rest of your code, which is kind of neat. Um, the service here is the same. And the only difference here, you might notice as we go down, um, does this one do this? No, this is something different. I'll, to, I'll discuss that in a second. So yeah, that was all that was involved in, in transferring. Well, not all that was involved. Uh, there's a couple little gotchas. So 
For example, if we look at this slide code, let's look in here. And slide has some references to, um, oh, I'm sorry, the slide. Well, not so much the slide does. Let me show you what happens when you edit a photo. That'll be a, a better description here. So let's go back to the classic version. If you're going to edit an existing photo, edit photo, right, which has the edit photo page, and all it does is render edit photo cell, same kind of same pattern there. Um, you'll see the difference in here, right? So there's our big query. And then in success, we're doing a bunch of stuff. There's some state in here. See this, use state. For example, which adjustments you've made. I keep track of those in state. And a trick with RSC is, because this is happening on the server, the server cannot use state. So you can't do this on the server. So how does this work in RSC land? No problem in GraphQL, do it here. If we go to RSC, we go to edit photo page. Edit photo page is the same. Edit photo cell though. Now success doesn't have any of that. Success renders something else. And we're calling this the cell, how do we, how do we call it? Cell success pattern? No, cell success component pattern. <laughs> so if you need to use a state in success, you can't do it right here. You need to render another component and now this component can use the state if that makes sense. So before we could do everything right in success directly. We could do all, the, all our fun new state stuff. Now we can't. So all we're going to do is we're going to package all that up into a separate cell. So edit photo success cell, or ed, sorry, edit photo success component now does all that stuff. So there's edit photo success. There's all of our new states. That's sort of a gotcha to know about React server components is if you ever need to use state, use context and stuff like that, it needs to be a client component. You'll see up here use client. So we're telling React, hey, don't try to render this on the server. You won't, you won't know how to do this because of this new state. So just let this work on the, on the client. And so React does some work to pull down this bundle and actually renders all this in the browser. It doesn't worry about doing that on the server. The server is just doing this part, getting the data, getting it prepared to send to this guy. Uh, we talked about that flight format. I can show you that really quickly. So if we open up our inspector here and let's go to the network tab and if we let me close console if we reload here you'll see right so this is the initial request this is like just give me the page which is just this shell there's really nothing in here right so i'm loading and then if we look down here let me find it right here so you'll see in this this is to rwrc home page so it rendered the layout and says oh i need a page let me get it hey rsc hey server Render this page for me. So it makes this call out and you'll see the response. This is this React flight syntax. And I discussed this in the blog. You can kind of look through here and see there's some, there's some neat little tricks in here. So it's like, you know, it's gonna render this and says, oh, by the way, to render this, you're gonna need the slide. So it references that file. And then in here, here's kind of all the data. So there's a little bit of HTML in here, but then mostly it's the photos, right? So there's photo ID one, file name. Photo ID two, file name. So it's kind of like a hybrid of passing the data and the HTML sort of mixed. See, here's some HTML stuff. And you'll see L3 references this guy. So it's like to render this, you'll need this to do so. So it's pretty interesting how they've compressed all this down into just simple, the simple syntax. It's sort of a JSON, JSX sort of hybrid kind of a thing. Uh, but yeah, I think that's it. Amy, did I miss anything? Is that right? Oh, wait, I can't hear you. I muted. Helps if I unmute. Uh, that's always a good thing. <laughs> uh, so you have a, a question from Jose in the chat. Since the user doesn't really do anything, wouldn't it be possible to return all content on a single request? The server realizes it's returning a cell, so it already returns the data. Do you follow? Uh doing anything on three. Is he referring to this graph? Let me share my screen again. This guy. Does he mean this three? Possibly. Jose, if you're still in the chat, if you maybe you, well, wait a minute for the lag and everything. <laughs> Uh, I think this is like the most confusing part for me with React server components is just understanding the flight patterns of data. Yeah, so you said exactly. So, and the question was, once you get to three, if, can you ask, say the question again? <laughs> oh, yeah, 
So wouldn't it be possible to return the content on a single request? So the server realizes it's returning a cell, so it already returns all the data. Uh, I believe once we have SSR working with RSC, right, that's basically what it will do. So it'll go through, it'll, and right now it doesn't work with RSC, but it will eventually just generate the whole page and send everything down at once. So as soon as you get to this step, basically everything is there, ready to go. You don't have to make this round trip to the server. Uh, but that's still being worked on. It's not quite there yet. Yeah, I think that's one of the other pieces that I've learned is that a lot of times we're conflating all of this stuff into a single button called RSC. And yeah. it's not all, all RSC. Like there's multiple pieces and components, uh, not to confuse a component with a component, but there's multiple <laughs> pieces of it that affect RSC because you're talking about a router, you're talking about streaming and then how does streaming work with all this stuff? And yeah. so um, it's not just RSC. Yeah, this is a, further down in the blog post. This is a really good graph that uh, Toby came up with, which hopefully breaks down better. Like what is rendering on the server? What is running on the client? Cause it's extremely confusing if you're coming just like a traditional React mindset and you're now going back to the old server way of rendering things, but it's a hybrid. It's half on the client, half on the server. So this graph is really neat, showing you the code, how it breaks down, what server, what's client. This tree is really, really good. So this is a really good reference if you need to get a handle on how this works. Yeah, and in the March town hall, Toby actually had a segment and talked through this entire graph and how it works. So if you're interested, I'd also encourage you to go check out that particular town hall. It's on our YouTube channel. Sweet. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Perfect. So the next thing that we want to do is we really want to highlight somebody within the community that's using Redwood. And so I'm going to invite Emmy. He has been building Moon Tower. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. It's great to see you. Yeah. All right. Let me share the screen here. I will share the window. Oh, look at that. Okay. So actually, before I start, a uh, bit about myself. I'm a software engineer, entrepreneur. Um, I actually, during my day job, I'm the founder and CEO and CTO of a company called Ezra that does... Uh, AI powered um, full body MRIs for cancer screening. Uh, and I love coding. So uh, in my spare time, together with a friend of mine, I created this uh, product called Moon Tower. Uh, and Moon Tower is built on Redwood. Um, I don't think we could have built it as quickly without Redwood. So I'm kind of a huge fan of, of what you guys have built. Uh, Moon Tower came out of a need that uh, Chris, my co-founder, and I had, uh, which is we're, we're both investors in our spare time, and we invest uh, in options quite a lot, or using options. And uh, Chris used to be a professional options trader. And together, last year, we started building these charts that uh, we use to inform our uh, investment decisions using options. And we realized very quickly that actually a lot of other people could uh, make use of these charts. And so we decided to build a product that gives people the ability to analyze options and figure out what is cheap and expensive in volatility terms in, in options uh, using a bunch of charts that we've uh, created that are kind of proprietary uh, Moon Tower charts. And so um, I'll give you a demo and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the tech stack, which I think is, is kind of like the main thing a lot of folks on, on this uh, live stream will be interested in. So everything you'll see is, is, is built on on Redwood. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how the, the kind of um, back end and, and data pipelines and so on. So um, the product, when you log in, we have what we call kind of an education uh, uh, section where you can learn everything you need to know about uh, options. And we have kind of this, uh, this primer, we called it, where you can kind of learn how to use the different uh, tools that we've created. Um, there's also a uh, walkthrough, a video walkthrough. All of this is free. People can just sign up um, and they can kind of learn about the product before having to pay for it. Um, once you kind of get an idea of, of what the product is, you can start using the different charts. And basically what we've done here is we've created two um, um, uh, kind of levels of insight into the options world. So one level is top of funnel, which is a cross-sectional 
analysis of uh, large ETFs uh, and their different um, uh, volatilities. And so what we're looking here, what we call dashboard, is the uh, implied volatility percentile versus the steepness, uh, which are kind of metrics of volatility across different assets. So if you're an options kind of trader or investor, you can come in here and at a glance, you can see what's cheap and what's expensive in terms of um, volatility. And so kind of SPY, which is um, the S&P 500, is currently kind of in the middle of, um, of this chart in terms of its percentile, IV percentile, which means it's kind of like a, a good time to look at potentially buying uh, SPY options. Um, we uh, All of the data you see in this chart is based on these tables, and we also kind of color code the tables in order for people to be able to see easily what assets have high IV percentile, IV rank, and so on. Um, this is one of the, the metrics. I know I kind of breezed through it. Uh, you probably need to read a little bit more on it to really understand what it's doing. But then we have a number of other similar metrics, uh, what we call realized volatility versus volatility risk premium, which is a measure of how rich an option is. Um, and this visualization gives you, again, a kind of uh, uh, a view on what's cheap and what's expensive across all of these different um, assets. We then have a metric called skew, which in options is really important. Um, skew is how skewed are the options towards the uh, out of the money uh, puts and out of the money calls. And I'm, I might be using terms that people don't um, understand, but again, it's kind of another way to look at uh, options. Um, and if you're interested to, for example, buy uh, SPY options, which is S&P 500, you can come here and see that if um, if the tails are really cheap, you could uh, buy those. Um, uh, otherwise, you can just buy at the money. Um, there's something called the vol scanner, which uh, shows the change in volatilities um, day over day. And so uh, if you're coming in and you are interested in a particular uh, ETF, you can see uh, at which matur maturity um, whether the particular ETF you're trying to buy was cheaper or more expensive the prior day. So it kind of gives you a, an idea of how uh, vols have changed over a um, period of uh, 24 hours. So this is what we call kind of top of funnel. This gives you a kind of big picture view on what's going on in the options market. And then as, a, as an investor, you want to drill into particular tickers or particular assets. So we have this um, page where you can choose an asset. In this case, we have TLT. Uh, we can go and we can choose uh, a SPY. And um, you get the volatility scanner, which is the same kind of view as the cross-sectional one, but drilled into a particular asset. Um, and then we have a number of other metrics. I won't really go into detail on all of these other metrics. Uh, they make sense if they're if you're an options a trader and if you guys want to learn more the education page kind of explains what all of these do um, and then we have kind of a number of other visualizations uh, for a particular um, asset in order to determine uh, what's cheap and what's expensive for for this asset and then finally we have uh, what we call a pairs comparison where you can go and you can compare two different assets in terms of their uh, volatility. So in this case, we can take two kind of large equity ETFs and um, look at different metrics such as their term structure, structure the IV, uh, so implied volatility, the realized volatility, and the volatility risk premium. Um, and you can kind of drill into this and see how these uh, two assets compare to each other. Maybe on a short one and, and long the other, uh, and, and so on. Um, and then we have a, a bunch of other kind of uh, features, like um, we have a, obviously a, what you would expect: the setting uh, section, technical support, um, and a GPT. And here, oh, there you go. Have an error. There we go. Uh, here, what we've done is we've created a a, a GPT that has uh, is connected to a, a vector database of content that we've written. And so um, if you ask something like, um, what is forward volatility, um, it will 
provide a response and together with the response we'll also give citations to um articles that my my co-founder chris has written um on his blog it didn't in this particular case it generally does maybe we find something like um how do you hedge an option um and um we have a, a moon tower um uh, sub stack and a bunch of other kind of resources that are all embedded into um into this gpt and um uh, and the responses uh, are included into the GPT whenever uh, applicable. So in this case, gave us a response with the citation. And if we click that, it sends us to the um, page uh, where it pulled that uh, content from. Um, so that's kind of Moon Tower in a, in a nutshell. Uh, obviously, I kind of did this very, very quickly so as to not kind of bore folks who are not, maybe not uh, well versed into options. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about uh, tech stack because uh, I really think without Redwood, it would have been much harder to, to build this. I, I basically spent a few hours each weekend over a period of a few months uh, to build the product. Um, the uh, data that you're seeing is all coming from a number of APIs and we use a tool called Daxter, which is a, a pipeline orchestrator to um, apply some transformations to that data, save it into a Postgres database. We then use Redwood um, with all of its good stuff. Um, I'm, I'm excited about RSC. In, in our particular case, GraphQL actually was a really good um, um, kind of built-in feature because we were able to do these kind of really complex queries into the database from multiple tables, and GraphQL really helped there. Uh, we use Superbase for auth for DB and for storage. Um, we use Vercel for hosting. Uh, we use Resend for emails, uh, Loops for um, kind of these event-based emails for engagement. All of the event tracking is done on segment. For analytics, we use GA and a thing called June, which is new, it's, it's quite good. It, it connects to segment and creates kind of built-in charts. Uh, we have a community section which is using discourse which i know um, uh, redwood uses as well for the community um, and then um, notion and, and we use ingest actually for some background um, daily jobs that that we uh, we have uh, so kind of this is the the tech stack uh, all kind of centered around redwood as the main kind of way to uh, to deliver the app to users um, so I'll, I'll pause there and happy to kind of chat if anyone has questions about uh, any of the tech stack. That's awesome. Thanks, Emmy. Thank you. Yeah, I love, um, I mean, I've personally benefited from just how fast Redwood allows us to prototype and iterate and build applications. So I'm glad to see that I'm not the only one. For sure. And, and I've used Next and other frameworks in the past and um, and I've used Rails, and so I kind of uh, really like uh, that Redwood is sort of like it gives you the efficiency of Rails, but in React, which is quite uh, quite awesome. Well, and I should also highlight since I did the framework comparison earlier, I've started to kind of just say I feel like all frameworks are great, and I think that we can all learn something from each other. Obviously, I'm biased toward Redwood, but it's interesting to kind of just see where those opinions are coming from and. I think that's one thing that makes senior engineers senior is that we have the experience to be able to discover those opinions and express them. Totally. Awesome. Thank you again. I'm going to. Uh, perfect. So before we wrap up, one thing that I did want to highlight is I'm going to pull my browser back up again, is that we did release 7.3 last week. So if you are running a Redwood project right now, please upgrade. This is a minor. So it's not using React server components, but it does give you several upgrades for various dependencies. So um, that's you know another good thing about Redwood is that it handles all that stuff for you. And upgrading is as easy as just running Yarn Redwood upgrade. So check out the change log if you want to um, see exactly what changes were made. And then I'm also going to pull up, um, let's see, that QR code. So again, feel free to 
join the Redwood React Server Components Working Group if you would like just the inside scoop on the things that we're doing and be able to provide feedback. Um, we would love for you to join our Slack and participate because this is a community project. It's the community that really helps drive Redwood and the features that we implement. So we're grateful for all of you. And on that note, um, if you have any questions, if you're watching this in the future or you're just processing the information that we're sharing, feel free to tag us on Twitter or jump in our Discord. We have a very active Discord. We're also on Discourse. So you can go to redwoodjs.com and you can find the links for all of those things. So thanks again. Happy April. And we will catch you the first Thursday in May.